Uh, I can't wait to see what happens next with Cove and uh, and Jamie. When he was safely on his feet, he briefly checked out his clothes, twisting around to see the back of his pants. He caught you looking and shrugged. I mean... I did go home after the event, but I knew I wasn't going to be able to settle down, so I just walked back out. I needed fresh air and time away from everything. He paused for a moment and raised his class together hands where you could see them. But then something happened and well, so I have something I want to show you. Cove grinned like a child and gently unfurled his fingers, not being able to keep you in suspense for even a minute. Carefully sitting inside was a tiny yellow light it blinked off and then on again. I firefly. Delicately, he moved his hand closer so you could see the creature better. They're back. He closed his eyes, his smile now faintly illuminated by his insect companion. <laughs> Remember the first time I caught one? I always will. I could barely manage anything because of that neon pink cast I was stuck with all summer. You were still stunned by what was happening, but couldn't help snickering when Cove did. It was thanks to you that I finally held a firefly in my own hand. I was happy too. Honestly, I didn't think I'd see them this year. I don't know why, it's just they were kind of late and I guess I'd been worrying about a lot of stuff lately. You could tell that the Firefly genuinely lived his spirits. He seemed at peace and he wanted to share that with you. The fact that this, his first thought up after discovering the Fireflies was to come over and celebrate the joy with you made you suddenly feel very cherished. Cove opened his eyes, but he looked away, not meeting yours. It's nice. It's really nice, I think. Even if the fireflies disappear for a while, it doesn't mean they're really gone. They'll come back. I can see them again. You smiled. Technically, fireflies aren't even gone. They're just eggs and larvae. You waited for him to continue. You smiled. And then you looked at the firefly keen keenly. There was definitely something poetic about them. You felt a warmth in your heart. Cove looked at your face, his smile now fragile. It makes me think about the two of us. We're together. Then we say goodbye. And then we're together again. Day after day, year after year, and even if our time apart gets longer, that doesn't make it forever. Jamie. Jamie, I'll always be there whenever you want to see me. You were so in love with him, there was nothing else you could think then, and he needed to know. You were so happy to be with him, and he needed to know that you quietly said his name. You were so in love with him, there was nothing else you could think then, and he needed to know. Your heart started to pound in your ears, and all you could hear was blood rushing. You looked at Cove and found yourself fixated. The only thing you were aware of was your rapid pulse in him. It was as if your entire relationship was playing over in your mind, every step that led you here. Everything from the first night you met to how you started as little kids who were good friends and grew even closer. To the first time you saw fireflies together. To the first time he snuck in your room. And then to every other moment you shared. 
all that came back to you. Kill's expression had turned curious as you left him waiting. Wordless, he tilted his head in the question. His lips parted to speak, but you went first. I love you. I'm in love with you. I, I love you, Cove. With your confession, the world stopped for a second. Co froze. Then, as if your words had turned a faucet, tears began to fall down Co's cheeks. He suddenly mouthed something, but you couldn't make out a word. Oh. His beautiful face. Oh, he's gonna make me cry. <laughs> Cove You step closer and closer Removing the distance between the two of you He covered his mouth with a hand He must have forgotten about the firefly resting there And it flew off into the night with a twinkle He used his other hand to shakily reach over And interlaced his fingers with yours he gripped you tightly as he started sobbing harder. You cried with him. You wiped away his tears. You squeezed his hand back. You smiled at him. You chuckled affectionately. You wiped away his tears gently. You took your free hand and wiped his tears away. I love you, Cove. It's okay, Cove. It's okay, I promise. Yeah, I had a feeling it would go like this. Can you tell me how you feel? I love you, Cove. Cove removed the hand from his mouth and used it to hold the back of your head. He brought your face to him, bending his neck down to, to be closer to your level and your foreheads brushed together. His voice trembled, it cracked, and it shook. This was raw, straight from Cope's heart. I love you. He closed his eyes tightly and repeated himself, but now he could say it firmly. I love you. His aqua eyes sparkled when he opened them again. Fresh tears poured out with an outburst of emotion. Sorry. Jamie. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't get it together. It's just, I tried so much to love you quietly, secretly, and that being it. But I, I really wanted you to feel the same. I wanted you to love me back. I wanted to hear you say it. I just kept thinking, what if you didn't? Maybe what I felt was too much, and I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know what to do. But I didn't want to put any of that on you either. You weren't doing something bad. Everything you do is right and wonderful. I'm always like this. It wasn't your fault I had to be like that. I'm just like that. He leaned in closer, hiding his face from you, his lips trailing over to your ear, he whispered. But you love me. You love me. He moved his head back so his forehead was centered on yours, and then he closed his eyes. He shook. The hand you still held was trembling. I am so sorry. I'm really always like this. You kissed him. You held him. You gave him a moment. You kissed him. You pulled him into you, kissing his lips. He returned it desperately. Cove managed to bring a fragile smile onto his face. He was still shaking, but there was something decided about him now. I love you. I love you, Jamie. I love you. He repeated it more as if to make up for all the times he didn't let himself say it before. As he spoke, his tears dried up and his breathing became more even. The reaffirmation helped him calm down. Thank you for telling me. Cole's smile was bolder even as his voice wavered and he ducked his 
head with a childish shyness. He clearly fought against getting emotional again. His watery eyes, his, his must hair, the tears still drying on his cheeks. You loved him so much. I needed to tell you. You've always been lucky, haven't you? I'm so, so happy to have done it. You're welcome. It was only the truth. I love you. You smiled brightly at him. I needed to tell you. You felt content in the moment. You really wanted to touch him a lot. You felt content in the moment. You couldn't help thinking about how happy you were to be with him, how you were certain you wanted to spend your life with him, how you were certain you wanted to spend your life with him, and you told him as much. You didn't need to pretend it wasn't true, not to yourself. You dreamed of waking up every day to him. You wanted Cope to be your partner through all that you'd experience in this world, and someday you wanted everyone to know just how much you loved him. For now, though, you were content to keep that only in your thoughts. Finally, he was able to laugh softly. The tears were nothing but salty remnants on his cheeks. He brightened up as if finally able to process the absolute joy of tonight in full. You felt good, too and took a little more time together to simply exist in the new dynamic you had stepped into. Cove looked into your eyes with a soft, slightly shy expression. There was hope in his smile. Do you know go do you wanna go to the hill with me? I bet there's still fireflies. Yeah. Cove brightened. He was practically bouncing at the thought of a secret excursion before he suddenly became bashful. So... Uh... So, how should we leave? We could just try the door. We don't have to do the window thing. But maybe that bother your family. You both chuckled at how awkward it would be if your moms, or worse, Liz, saw you going on a midnight firefly catching trip. You'd be sure to avoid that. But you wanted to use the front door. You could leave from your window. Let's go through the window. Cove nodded in understanding. You grabbed some shoes and readied yourself for an adventure. You were glad that there was no way you'd run into another soul outside. Cove would be overdressed and you were still in your jammies. You let Cove go first. He stepped back on the ledge as you carefully followed. He shuffled along and soon you reached the garage. You planned to use the fence from there to reach the ground. Cove climbed down the fence. He wobbled once, but he made it without an issue. You leaned against the fence and projected hushed words up to where you were waiting. Are you okay? Do you want help? He nodded yes. You got to the edge and let Cove spot your descent. He grabbed you about halfway down and brought you to rest firmly on the ground. Cove gave you an encouraging smile, but neither of you risked speaking yet. You briskly snuck behind the house and up to the old white poppy hill. And Cove was right. The entire hill was lit up, insects twinkling here and there with their pale yellow light. Cove let out a contented sigh, finally able to relax in full. He strove further up the hill to better enjoy the view. You walked along as well letting yourself be surrounded by the twinkling display. Then, without warning, Cove plopped onto his back. He paid no mind to smacking his formal attire in the grass. He put an arm under his head and stretched the rest of his limbs out. He was clearly getting quite comfortable in the dirt there. You sat down. You laid down in the grass. You sat down first and then fell back. You could see the stars when you looked up at the night sky. 
Then you snuggled against Cove, then you wrapped an arm around Cove. You enjoyed your space. You snuggled against Cove. He was warm in the contrast to the chilly ground. Cove cuddled closer in turn, tucking his arms up near your shoulders. So. Hmm. I wonder if Dad will be mad about the grass stains. He tugged at the collar of his shirt. He didn't sound concerned. Just idly curious. Maybe you should figure out how to clean it before he finds out. His smile bent a little and it went silent between you. The only sounds were the rustling of bugs and the, and the breeze and the faraway crashes of waves on the sea. You couldn't help but reflect on what happened only a brief time earlier between this and your, mur and your room. This almost felt like a different world. Was it even real? What happened between you two? You could almost be convinced it wasn't and that you had never actually stopped dreaming. You stole a glance at Cove. He caught you and blushed. That little rending reassured you. Cove remembered the same as you. What you had was real. You continued watching fireflies. You wanted to catch some fireflies. You and Cove. You asked Cove if he wanted to catch fireflies. You challenged him to rolling to a rolling race down the hill. You asked Cove to dance with you. Uh. You asked Cove to dance with you. Hey Cove, do you feel like dancing? Cove stared at you in shock at the invitation. Understandably, he had not expected that. You felt obligated to try to say more. I just like to. It makes sense. Look at how you're dressed. I just like to. Cove's eyebrows crinkled and he smiled softly. Okay. You got up and brushed off your clothes as best you could. A pesky blade of grass tried to stay stuck to your leg. Cove did likewise, wiping his hands on his pants to clean them off. You faced across each other and suddenly the process of what you were doing became more real. Co hesitated a moment as you both tried to decide what move to make now. He smiled as he wrapped one arm around your waist and the other across your back. He pulled you closer, near enough that your bodies were touching. Then you began to sway together amid the floating lights. Despite the lack of music, you found a rhythm to your movements. Back and forth, step to the side and slide. It was relaxed and freeing. Your eyes never strayed from one another for a time. You just ex existed in the moment, holding each other close and enjoying being together. The hour grew late and the fireflies mostly dispersed until only a few stragglers remained. Then even they blinked out of sight, leaving you alone with Cove in your thoughts. Cove stole a second to release the words that had been filling his head during the quiet. I love you, Jamie. You felt a great deal of happiness. Ko's expression was completely open, honest, and full of sincerity. He meant every word. He truly loved you. No matter how much it didn't seem real yet, it was. It felt as though this was a night that would never end, but you knew it would have to, all too soon. You were only grateful to have been a part of it. These were moments to truly treasure. You'd never let yourself forget them. After finishing breakfast at the Holden's house, you and Cove had retreated to his room to relax before starting the day in earnest. Or perhaps you would take it easier for the whole afternoon. Neither of you had plans exactly, so you were free to do whatever came to you to mind. You were leaning against Cove on his bed. You fiddled with the Rubik's Cube Cove had around. You stood watching Cove fish swim idly around their tank. You sat next to Cole on his bed, toying with his hair. You ran your fingers through the short strands, flipping them between your fingers as if you were a hairstylist assessing a new look. 
Really though, you just like the way the bristles tickled your fingers. Even with your mind elsewhere, you could tell Ko was similarly at ease. He had his chin propped up with one hand as he scrolled through his phone. A burst of laughter broke the silence, hooking your attention and bringing you back to the present. You looked at Ko for an explanation. His eyes, now crinkled with mirth, were still locked on his screen. What's so funny? He finally looked up at you, smirking. <laughs> Dad scanned some old photos, you know. He drew a rectangle in the air with the phone free hand. Printed out some printed out ones. Back from when I was little. He texted it all to me last night, I guess. I've been checking them out. You were looking at your kitty photos and didn't tell me? Can I see? That's cool. You smiled. That sounded nice. You sat up wide eyed and hopeful. You wanted to see. Can I see? Cove narrowed his eyes, smile still bent. I was gonna show you. I was just, I just wanted to look at it first to make sure there was nothing super embarrassing. You never know with my dad. He grimaced envisioning what horrors his dad might unwittingly spring on him. I mean... I mean, if there's a photo of me getting potty trained or something... He suppressed an empathetic shudder and nodded. He laughed at Ko's fraught expression. Kid pictures are supposed to be embarrassing, that's part of the fun. He suppressed an empathetic shudder and nodded. Ko only cleared his throat nervously. The fear of his dad, well-meaning actions, were still looming large in his mind. Anyway, before we forget, I was laughing because I came across a Halloween one from when I was eight. The year I was a zombie, remember? He shook his head, grinning wryly while holding the phone out to you. I never even liked zombies. All I wanted was to show off my new scar. And it needed to be something scary. I couldn't be a normal person who had a scar, according to my eight-year-old mind. I was a little dork. Right? Dad really wanted to be useful, as usual. He came up with the idea of being an undead person. It was pretty good, huh? Man, I was so jealous of that look. It was good, but my costume that year was better. Liz was so grossed out, and Shiloh was terrified. I remember you getting lots of extra candy when adults realized the scar was real. It was hard seeing your arm like that. I don't really remember. Oh, somebody get Joseph's. Liz was grossed out and Shiloh was terrified. He laughed, still clearly remembering their faces from when they saw Cove's get up that night. Cove chuckled at your reply. I can't believe how much larger my scar used to be. He looked down his arm, a soft smell on his face and traced what remained of the jagged line with his fingers, just as you'd seen him do countless times before. His voice was playful when he spoke again. <sighs> Look at how tiny it is now. How am I gonna pretend to be tough without a big scar? Cove, you've never fooled anyone. You are relieved that he accepted and even liked his scar. It's a definite blow to your street cred. It still looks cool. You better not do anything stupid to get a new scar. You joked, 
wagging a finger at him. He sighed in a long, suffering way. It's a definite blow to your street cred. You relieved that he accepted the even like this guy. You better not do anything stupid to get a new scar, you joke, wagging a finger at him. No matter how much you like them. I won't. Poe smiled bashfully, pleased with his joke, and ducked his head to look away from you. His fingers were still tracing the scarred patch of skin. I really do like having this, even if it's is kind of little these days. His voice was shy, like he was letting you in on a big secret. Cove turned back to face you fully, finally letting go of his scar. He was happy. That mark was a part of him and clearly held meaning for Cove. Reaching over, you laid a reassuring hand on his arm where the scar was. Reaching over, you laid a reassuring hand on his arm where the scar was. You cupped his arm with your fingers carefully as your thumb ran down the outline of the scar. Along with the rougher tissue of the scar, you could also feel goosebumps on his arm. Cove let out a choked breath, a dizzy smile playing out on his face. It was evident that he liked the feeling. You held his gaze. Co couldn't stay still and reached for you with his free hand. His fingers brushed against your cheek. He leaned forward, eyes gleaming. Can I kiss you? Please do. No. You shook your head. You nodded. Please do. His cheeks burned red as he closed the gap between you, his mouth gently meeting yours. You held onto his arm like a lifeline as you kissed him back, briefly worried that you might drown in the depths of your feelings. Then you opened your eyes, meeting coves, and knew that the feeling was mutual. He laid his forehead to rest against yours. You felt his hot breath tickling your face. Heads touching your hand on his arm, you were entwined with Cove. It felt so right. Time couldn't register in that moment. It could have been seconds or minutes, but eventually you straightened up, lifting your hand from his scar. That seemed to break the spell, though he stayed close to you. Cove sat up and came to his senses. Your eyes drifted back to the scar on Cove's arm. The scar had been there as long as you'd known Cove, Though when you first met, it had been concealed by that neon pink cast. So? Wanna hear how I managed to go jet skiing when I was eight? You were initially stunned that he'd guessed what you were thinking. Though given the topic of conversation and the direction of your gaze, it was a, it was a natural conclusion to reach. Not bothered by your action, Co continued with a shrug. I don't mind telling you, it's nothing special. He rubbed the back of his neck, grinning sheepishly. Mostly it's just a really dumb. You nodded. That was something you'd like to hear more about, especially knowing that no lasting harm had come of it. Grove stared into the distance, lips parted as he readied the story in his mind. So me, my dad, and mom were at a party. I don't know if it was a casual get-together or a specific celebration. I hope it wasn't for something meaningful, considering how I, I ended it. He winced and managed a bashful smile. Anyway, my mom and dad were off doing stuff, talking to people, I guess. I was left with the other non-adults. Most of them were older than I was. Maybe all of them were. His brow furrowed as he tried to recall dusty memories. Then he shrugged again and continued. The older kids were taking turns on the jet skis. 
there weren't enough for everyone to ride at once, so in between turns they were hanging out on the shore. I was meant to just sit there with them and watch. Remembering when you first met Cove, you bet that he hadn't been satisfied with that arrangement. He confirmed that suspicion. I was pretty unhappy. It wasn't a part for, party for me. Not when all I could do was look at other people have fun when I couldn't. The teens must have realized that, though I never hid when I was pouting as a kid. Only when you were a kid? Cope bristled with embarrassment. It looked pretty sulky to you. Come on, let me finish the story. All right, Cove sighed, letting go of the interruption and picking up where he left off. Well, Basically, someone offered to let me ride. I was way too small to drive myself, but this older kid, they must have been at least 16, said I could sit in front of them while they controlled the jet ski. I knew I wasn't supposed to do anything like that. Still, I figured my parents were doing whatever they wanted, so why couldn't I? I nodded at the person and I remember the other teens helping me onto the jet ski, along with the one driving. We sped off into the water. Ko smiled widely and wistfully. It was amazing, at first. My hair was flying everywhere as we zoomed away from the shore. I loved being out on the water like that. Too bad it turned out steering a jet ski with an eight-year-old sat on your lap was harder than a bunch of kids figured it would be. The team tried their best, but they couldn't keep control for long. We got spun around and went right into the sand. He sucked in a deep breath. The other person wasn't hurt, thankfully. They held onto the bars and stayed in their seat. I didn't. I was thrown at full speed into a rocky part of the shore near the dock. I must have tried to brace for impact or catch myself because my arm is what I mostly landed on. It looked, he looked down at the limb in question. You could see him visualizing the long healed injury. That's... It was pretty torn up after that. It's hazy for me. I got taken to the hospital. I didn't feel a lot of pain when it first happened. All I remember thinking about was how I covered in sand and the grains were uncomfortable. The sand was uncomfortable. The sand was uncomfortable? Co chuckled. I know, right? I did start feeling my arm later. It definitely hurt eventually. The doctor said my arm was broken, along with being torn open. That's how I ended up getting my pink cast. He smiled nostalgically. That color, it seemed just nice and happy at the time. It brightened the mood, so I picked it. The smile faded. He finished the story with a sigh, his eyes downcast. I feel bad I did any of that. I hope whoever that teen was, they weren't traumatized by seeing a little kid go flying into the ground. They were just trying to do a nice thing. Cove threw arms out to the side dramatically. <sighs> I wish I knew who they were so I could give them a call and say I'm still in one piece. But yeah, that's the full story. I'm so glad you were both okay in the long run. I'm so glad you were both okay in the long run. That's the important thing. Cove sighed again, the regret written plainly on his face. It was a failure. That's just the truth. He smiled flatly. I but to my credit, I think I've grown a lot since then. I... Wait. Cove's eyes went completely wide. Suddenly reinvigorated, he seized his phone and tapped away at the screen. 
What's up? I knew it. You weren't sure that he'd heard you, but he set his phone down and turned to face directly to you. His face was resolute. Though the glow on the screen was no longer reflected in his eyes, they seemed to sparkle even brighter than before. Jamie, we're adults. We can decide things for ourselves now. You only realize that now? Okay, where is this going? I like where this is headed. The age requirement to rent a jet ski in California is 18. We could totally do it. Let's use our adult powers for a jet skiing adventure. Cove beamed, pumping the air with both fists. Definitely the action of someone mature enough to rent a vehicle. All right. Within a moment, Cove had recovered and returned to his serious expression from before. I'll be careful, and I really want you to be there when I try again, please? His voice was soft and earnest. You could tell how much the request meant to him. You also knew him enough to know that he wasn't going to give up on this idea. Letting him go on his own wasn't an option. Of course I'll be there. I wouldn't miss it. I actually love jet skiing. Cole perked up at once. A grin stretched wide across his face. He was practically bouncing in place. Mm -hmm. Let's go! You got up and worked as a team to gather everything needed for the trip. Cove's other aquatic hobbies came in handy, and he was quickly kitted out with everything he'd need other than the jet skis themselves. You need to run back home briefly, having dressed and prepared for a day that didn't involve jet skiing, but soon enough you were both ready and jumping into Cove's car. As you got in, you learned that Cove had used the brief time apart to locate a rental store on his phone. You caught his eye as you clicked your seatbelts into place. Excited, you held out a hand. Cove slapped it in a high five before setting off. You and Cove soon arrived. The ocean was perfectly inviting today. The deep blue of the water glittered under the sky, clear sky, while the tide rolled in and out at its leisure. I'm so excited for this. You were just as pumped as he was. His excitement was adorable. Seeing how pleased you were, Cove grinned at you. Hey. Oh, hey. Wanna say hi to my dad while we're here? I've already texted mom about the plan. He's working right now. The shop is just down the way. We can walk. Sure, we can do that. Mr. Holland was a great guy, so you were happy to check in on him. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry it might be kind of awkward when he hears why we're here, but it should be alright. I mean, my parents forgave me a long time ago for that amazing stunt. I don't want to be scarred off jet skiing for my whole life because of it. You wonder which of you... Cove was attempting to reassure. It was only a short walk back down the dock to Mr. Holden's scuba shop. Cove breezed in, as familiar with the store as he was with his own home. The place was quiet, empty aside from a couple of customers quietly browsing in Cove's dad behind the counter. Mr. Holden looked up, his friendly expression spreading into a grin when he was when he saw who had just entered. Hey! Hi, Jamie. Hey, sport. What brings you all the way out here? Hey, Cass and, Cass and I... 
he cast an eye at the way the two of you were dressed. Judging by how you were decked out, I'm guessing scuba diving? There's plenty here for that. What can I help you with? Cove chuckled, amused by how quickly his dad seized on a favorite topic. Or maybe it was how his dad always fell over himself trying to be useful. Hi, Dad. Um, we're not doing that this time. We're sort of decided to go rent a couple of jet skis. The phrase jet skis had set Mr. Holden's mouth in a taut line immediately. Jet skis? He echoed the words as his eyes instinctively darted to the scar on Coe's arm. That's... That's how... That's when... Mr. Holden started to speak several times. Each attempt quickly abandoned. Co smiled encouragingly, trying not to add to his father's worries. Don't worry about it. I promise I'll be careful, and Demi will be there too. We always look out for each other. Mr. Holden pinched his face back into an unconvincing smile. Right. All right, you're a whole lot bigger now than you were back then. Heck, you can drive a car and everything. I'm sure you and Jamie will have plenty of fun. The worry still echoed out in his voice, barely concealed by the positive words, but Cove was buoyed by his father's support. Yeah, well, we're all set. We only stopped by to say hi and let you know since we were over here. Mr. Holton beamed, obviously moved by his son's simple consideration. Wow. You're so thoughtful. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Dad, you don't need to thank me for that. Mr. Holden simply laughed at his son's response. It'd be great if you could keep me in the loop while you're out there too. Just text me to let me know if things are going well or, or anything. I will. His dad smiled more easily. Great. Great. Cove rubbed at his arm, causing Mr. Holden's eyes to momentarily twitch back to the childhood injury. Bye. We're gonna head out. See you later. Take care. See you, Mr. Holden. Mr. Holden waved you off as you left the store. The pair of you headed back to the docks, walking side by side. After your feet hit the boards, Cove's pace fell. Glancing over, you saw him looking down out over the water. That wouldn't have been unusual if his expression hadn't been so somber. <coughs> he wasn't geared up with anticipation or even nervousness, but with an uncharacteristic lethargy. Something was weighing heavy on his mind. What's up? Huh? He blinked, startled by you interrupting his rumination. Sorry. Oh, sorry. He sighed, though you'd torn his attention from the ocean. It gradually drifted back to the water. You cleared your throat, unwilling to lose him again. Sorry, again. He put his hands to his face, rubbing his eyes wearily. Here I go, thinking everything's resolved with what's happened, and we can have fun, but I can't just enjoy anything. I had to find something else to get stuck in my head. You're having second thoughts about jet skiing? No. No, that's not it. The end of his lips were drawn into the beginning of a frown, like gray clouds clustering to, sing to signal a coming storm. I figured my dad would be a little worried about me doing it, but what he was saying, it wasn't what I expected. He was so sad. It was more than nervous. I think he feels bad, and now I feel bad. But it isn't as if I'm the one who ever does something stupid or gets hurt. It got me thinking about the whole time that's when I realized it wasn't long after that accident that my parents separated. You 
stayed quiet. As a kid, I didn't think about the consequences of my actions, you know, or how what I did impacted other people. Like, why should anyone care? I'm the one doing it, not them. It made no sense, and I still cared when other people did things. I didn't like, I didn't like, but I was eight and mostly just mad that nothing felt like it was in my control. You could tell that he was building up to something, so you nodded for him to continue. I was pretty difficult to deal with because of that attitude, but looking back, I think that's what saved me from something a lot of kids go through. Blaming themselves for their parents' divorce. It never crossed my mind that anything I did made a difference on my mom and dad's relationship. They would do what they did no matter what. Now though, I guess it's kind of hard to ignore that th thought th huh? I need. Mean... Their situation was already so hard and I wasn't a good kid, so. He left his words drift as he looked down. The conclusion unfinished. It was silent between you. But only for a second, Cove pulled himself up to his full height. His chin held aloft. What, whatever he decided, he was resolute. I'm going back. I've got to talk to my dad. I'm not going to let things be like before, where I just feel crappy and refuse to even tell him what's going on. That doesn't work for either of us. You can go ahead if you want. I won't mind. I still really want to do this. And I'm sure it'll be okay. I want to stay with you. We always look out for each other, remember? Cole smiled gently, having wanted that deep down. Thanks. Let's go. You and Cove retook your steps down the docks once more, heading back to Mr. Holden's scoop shop. The customers you spotted in there before were now leaving the store, new bags clutched in their hands. You hoped that this would mean Cove could have his conversation with a public, without a public audience. This time, Cove strode inside the shop with purpose. Mr. Holden, still at the counter, glanced up to meet greet whoever had come inside. He grinned as you approached. How's it going? Hello again. Forgot something? Sort of. COVID reached the counter now. You needed to rush to get just to keep up with him as he crossed the show floor. Mr. Holden raised an eyebrow, taking in Coach's shift in attitude and choose his next words with care. Is everything all right? Cove swallowed, not answering initially. Talking openly with his dad was still somewhat new for the son. You knew that he was struggling for the right way to begin. I wanted to ask about what happened. Mr. Holton wins as if the words had struck him physically. The accident? No. The divorce. The pained expression fell from Mr. Holden's face, wide-eyed, his jaw slight. He gaped at Cove. Huh? Why? Cove glanced over his shoulder at you. As your eyes met, you saw him draw confidence by having you by his side. He turned back to his father. I want to know the truth. His tone was grave. Did me getting into the accident hurt your marriage? If I hadn't done it, would you and Mom have gotten along better? No. Hell no. Mr. Holden squashed the suggestion with a gravity you'd rarely heard in his voice. 
You were eight years old. You're not responsible in any way. Kira and I should have protected you. <sighs> I can understand why you're feeling that. What happened was so horrible. How could it not have an impact? It did. It was a reflection of us as parents. The relationship between just your mom and me was separate and already unsalvageable. Cope turned away, his brow still furrowed as he looked at the floor. Maybe I'm being anxious and it's taking over, but it wasn't just then. I always caused problems. He plowed on, unwilling to give up without explaining his worries. What if I'd been easier to raise? Or if you'd had me later on? Maybe even if you didn't have me at all, it might have been better for the two of you. If I didn't have you, then what good would my life be? Mr. Holden didn't let the words hang unchallenged in the air for even a second. He hurried over to Cove, taking his son's arms in his hands. Cove, listen. There is only one person to blame for things not working, and that's me. Cove opened his mouth to speak, but Mr. Holden forced on, determined to erase any question in Cove's mind. I'm not saying this to, to dishonestly push accountability off from someone else or to throw a pity party for myself. You want to know the truth? So that's what I'm giving you. Your father is the reason our family couldn't stay together. You think you caused trouble? You should have seen me at your age. You're such a good kid. I can hardly believe how good you are. Mr. Holland's eyes were misty as he squeezed his son's arms. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, you need to blame yourself for. I'm sorry, Cove, to you and to Kira. Mom? Yeah. Your mom. His pained face eased slightly into a bittersweet smile. Mm. Kira. She was just so smart and driven and completely bursting with life. It was as if she could do anything. You know, there wasn't a single solitary person who didn't want even a piece of her attention just to catch her eye for a moment. But for some crazy reason, she had a soft spot for my 17-year-old screw-up self. That's when we first met, though it definitely took some time before I managed to ask her out on a date. Mr. Holland shook his head, a smile melting as his re recollection became solemn once more. And then we'd only been officially together for about six months when we found out we were having a baby. I was so worried, so scared, but she was so brave. She was my rock, but we both knew the road ahead was going to be rockier. When we got married, I didn't see it as a dream come true. I wasn't about to start living my life in the only way I could imagine doing so. I thought what happened happened, and throwing my cards in with a girl like her was worth the risk. He grimaced. The sentence sour in his mouth, regretting his past for sex. I've been taking care of myself on my own and getting by. Then all of a sudden, I was going to have a wife and a child. That's... So I thought, all right, I'd better step things up and take care of all of us. And that's what I did. Sort of. He rolled his eyes. I made money, kept a roof over our heads, and put food on the table. But I was always busy, focused on taking care of things, that I didn't stop to consider what anyone else was thinking or what they actually needed. I made every decision about what I did, and as a result, what happened to the family, by myself, never asking what your mom felt or even wondering if she might have an opinion. I'd tell Kira about the great place I'd found and how we'd be moving there in the same breath. Or that I'd spent all our savings and taken out a loan to start the business business we're standing in, and even more nonsense. Anything I felt I needed to do, I did. 
Kira couldn't even ask where I'd been all day without me rolling my eyes like she was being a nag. I was making sure we didn't starve, obviously, right? Couldn't she trust me? He sighed, his head hung low. Yeah. She went to school part-time while raising you, really knuckling down, but that didn't matter to me back then. She could have spent her days lying in bed, not dying, and I would have felt the same. I didn't care. I was going to get it all done on my own either way. <coughs> it's so stupid. I admired her more than anyone when there was nothing at stake. Yet as soon as responsibilities were involved, I couldn't let myself rely on her. He combed a hand through his hair, searching for an understanding of his own younger self. I'm not even sure why. Maybe I had something to prove. Maybe I'm the one who didn't trust her in the end. Poor Kira. She had to spend every day mentally weighing the pros and the cons of putting up with my horrible ideas for the sake of peace or trying to explain to my blockheaded self what I was doing wrong. It must have been so stressful and frustrating, constantly having to let everything go because I was stubborn and absolutely would make a fight out of it. He snorted bitterly. <laughs> I was definitely stuck in my head a lot those days. Our relationship at that point was made of arguments and cool tolerance, but I still genuinely didn't see the divorce coming. We made it through the first few years, and after that, I never really considered it ending. It was just how life was. In retrospect, it's clear Kira kept thinking on it more every year, especially because she managed to finish her journalism degree. And with us being more stable, financially that is, she thought of everything. She even timed it right when your school ended for the year. So the process would hopefully be all settled before you had to worry about class again. We were already talking about it before the accident ever happened. I know I took it really hard, being a sad sack all around the neighborhood, but even that is unfair of me. When it shook out, I'm the one who got everything. Kira didn't want to leave you, Cove. She never would have. I'm certain she felt like she had no choice but to end the relationship. The business was doing really well by then, so I had an easier time making a living. She was between jobs, and when she did get a new job, it meant that she'd be traveling all the time. That's why she willingly accepted me having full custody. She didn't get to be there with her child for so many moments and you had to spend half of your life growing up without your mother, and it's my fault. Mr. Holden closed his eyes briefly as he took a breath. So that's it, the story of Cliff and Kira's marriage. Not exactly a fairy tale, but I want to be clear. You saw his grip on Koshal arms tighten. No matter what happened with me and her, I'd never, ever want to miss out on being your dad. Code's throat bobbed as he swallowed, his eyes glistened, glossy with tears that had yet to fall. He blinked quickly, trying to hold them back. Thank you for telling me. His voice was hoarse, little more than a whisper. Mr. Holden brought a hand up to his face and lightly nudged Code's chin. You're welcome. You're a grown up now, right? You deserve the truth. That's the least I can do for you. Cove managed a fragile smile. Thank you for taking care of me, for all of it. Mr. Holden brushed the compliment off with a wave of his hand. No worries. It was nothing. Look at where we ended up. I've got this whole entire store. A house, friends here, a very thoughtful son. It's all good for me. I'm so glad. I'm glad. His voice was still quiet, and he ducked his head shyly after saying the words. Mr. Holden patted him on the back. You could see the tears in Cliff's eyes still shining, threatening to spill over. Mr.
I straddled and put an arm around his shoulders, gently steering him towards the door. You should go have fun. Make some nice memories. Cove's gaze flickered over to you. The watery smile on his face soft, solidified. All right. Good. Now, out you go. Mr. Holden nudged the two of you out of the shop. You both walked silently as you made your return to the docks. Coast's face was pensive, clearly still digesting everything his dad said. He finally sighed, catching your attention. He hesitantly reached for the bag he had brought and raised it up. Jamie. Jamie. I want to call my mom. I'm not going to leave her out of things, and I want to know what she thinks about what happened and all that. He fiddled with the straps of his bag. He still remained closed shut. It's not like I don't trust Dad. It's just Mom's thoughts are important too. I get it, Cove. There's two sides to every story after all. He seemed relieved that you understood. You knew he didn't want to be a bother with another delay. Thanks. Then I guess there's no time like the present time to ask. With a mini pep talk, he finally opened his bag and found his phone. Cove unlocked it quickly and tapped over to his favorite contacts. He called up his mom and put the phone on speaker as he dialed. Kira must have had her phone closed because she answered almost immediately. Cove. Cove, this is a pleasant surprise. I thought you'd be getting back to me later. Ma, hey mom. He paused for a second and then looked at you. You're on speakerphone with Jamie too. Hey Kira. Oh, hello, hello. I'm popular today. Well, what's going on? Don't keep me in suspense. Are you a pro jet skier already? Cove chuckled and scratched the back of his head. Um, we haven't started yet. Actually, there's something I kind of want to ask you about. Really? Really? I'm intrigued. Her voice was bright and excited. Cove moved the phone closer to his face so he could speak softly, aware that the tone of his conversation was about to change. I was talking to Dad earlier. It was about your relationship and why you both divorced. Ah. Uh, that one syllable had lost all her earlier energy. Cove tightened his grip on the phone. It does make sense that the past would come up today. Yeah, but... He tried to brighten up the mood again. You weren't used to being the perky one of the two. You could only imagine it felt like a strange role reversal for him. Dad said you were really amazing. He admired you a lot. What a flatterer. She sighed wistfully, and you could hear some interference. Maybe she had shaken her head. You couldn't tell for sure. <gasps> oh, Cliff. He bungled himself the regular, everyday adulting and social situations in astoundingly charming ways. Yet somehow, at the exact time, he was an amb ambitious, slightly shady, under the table type of man when it came to making his living in the world. So essentially, your father was an absolute heartthrob for someone such as myself. Cove and Kira laughed delicately. The tension was broken into something lighter, more familiar between the two. It's cool you both have nice things to say about each other. I agree, baby. She took a moment before continuing carefully. Do you have questions about what happened? I'm not sure. Cope squinted at the phone in his hand as he tried to think, his free 
soft hand brushing through his hair. I just kind of wanted to know how you describe what it was like. Could I tell you what Dad said about it? Alright. Hmm. I don't think Cliff would mind. Whatever he told you is probably what he'd say to me. Alright, go for it. After taking a break, Cove recapped Cliff's experience. Doing his best to follow his dad's story, he went into a surprising amount of detail and not a single thing was missed. Kira listened on in absolute silence, letting her son speak without interruption. When Cove finished, he took another deep inhale of air. So, uh, what do you think? Kira sighed softly. He heard a clacking noise like she was drumming her nails on the back of her phone or on a countertop. That definitely sounds like Clifford. It's not exactly wrong, but he doesn't have a total picture. He puts the emphasis on the wrong places, I think. Huh? What do you mean? For starters, Cliff unsurprisingly downplayed himself more than he had to. He did? Cove's eyebrows raised and his face continued to inch even closer to the screen. Well, since your dad was so praising of me, it's only fair to return the favor. When Cliff said he was already taking care of himself when he met me, he means he was on his own. Cliff's own parents weren't and still aren't friendly people. They've always had a combative relationship, though him getting into drinking and gambling as a teenager certainly didn't help. He knew they'd kick him out at 18, so he saved them the trouble and left home at 17. He always found a way to make it work, even without support. I met him a few months after that. We hit it off right away. He was exactly what I wanted back then. We dated and then about a half a year later, bam, you were on the way, Cove. She laughed fondly as Cove clung to every word. I was really optimistic about it all. I couldn't wait to be a mother and I was more than happy that Cliff was the father who'd be along for the ride. We got married quick, before you were born. Cliff's recollection of our wedded dynamic is pretty spot on. Aww. He was extremely stubborn and just, well, immature. Highly, highly immature. Her voice raised slightly, and you got the feeling she was thinking back to her memories living with him. She left the specifics unspoken. But it's not like I was grown up either. Everyone, except maybe Cliff, could see our relationship was no good. Or at least not good enough yet to commit to. I knew, but I still, I didn't want to give it up. I wanted to keep the family together. I thought that if we divorced, or were never together, then we'd ruin your life, Cove. Obviously, that wasn't true. I just didn't have enough experience at the time to realize there wasn't only one option for us. Maybe things would have been easier on you if we had split when you were still a baby. But it took me years to start figuring it all out. Cove nodded, even if his mom couldn't see it, thinking hard about something. He was likely remembering his own experiences back then. We were married, but never seriously loved each other. We hardly knew each other. I don't mind that Cliff never viewed marrying me as some kind of dream come true. I honestly just appreciate that he tried giving me my hastily made life plan a shot. I was the one who proposed after all, got down on one knee and everything. Take this off of me. Oh, it won't. What time I try to pull it, it won't come off. 
How did you get it on there? Let's put the other title on me. It's in a knot. I shouldn't have done it. I'm gonna have to cut it off. Yeah. Hang on. I'll be right back. I got some scissors over here. Sorry. I needed to help my nephew with something. She huffed slightly, something between a chuckle and a sigh. It's very funny and a little sad that Cliff still doesn't know why things changed between us. It's obvious to me. And I guess he does know deep down, he just never consciously made the connection. I'm not even mad he didn't stay the same towards me. Love makes everything different. But you said... I know what I said. She interrupted before Cove could even finish his blurted out interjection. I don't mean Cliff and I. We were just two kids in a relationship that only ever worked when it was at its easiest. And then you were born, little cove James Holden. I loved you immediately, and so did your father. Cove was stunned. His eyes started watering as his mouth clamped shut. The inclination we had towards the inclination we had towards each other paled in the face of that. Our love to you was the real deal. Cliff was the proudest papa. Then, in true cove fashion, tears began to fall. He stayed silent, but you were pretty sure Kira knew the effect her words had on her on her son. No matter how much time passed, Cliff never got oh. No matter how much time passed, Cliff never got over how amazing it was that such a precious little boy was his. I should have taken pictures of how he'd puff up whenever someone referred to you as his son. She sounded much cheerier now. A slight smile crept on Co's face despite his tears. <laughs> Then again, he still does that now. It wasn't hard to imagine Mr. Holden lighting up around Baby Cove the same way he did with 18-year-old Cove. Hmm, I remember how, when a real argument started brewing, Cliff had a habit of walking away to cool off. He wasn't able to handle it. His son seems to have taken after him in that way. You heard her chuckle, and Cove looked down, a blush clear on his cheeks. You could just feel her smirk through the phone. She breezed over the next section airily. For our whole relationship, he always ended fights by skipping out on me for who knew how long. I don't think even Cliff knew when he'd come back. That stopped when you were born. Cliff stopped running. He was still gone a lot for work, and we still had fights, but he wouldn't leave. Instead, he'd go to your room cove. If you were asleep, he'd just sulk on the ground by your crib until you woke up. Sometimes he'd pace the room while holding you or sit on the floor and rock you. 
We stayed with you until one of us decided we were ready to talk again. We didn't have a lot of furniture back then. That's part of the reason why Cliff was always hanging out on the floor. He really came to embrace it. When our relationship got bad enough that he didn't want to share a bed anymore, he always made sure I got to have the mattress. He instead set up a spot in the corner of the nursery, just in case you needed anything through the night. He gave you a more private space when you got bigger, but he still always made sure he could be there for you. There's still no denying whether Cliff understood or not. He made his choices without prior to, prior to, prioritizing me, but it wasn't that he suddenly hated me. To Cliff, I was only a wife on paper. In his mind, I was a cool girl he had dated and generally liked. Nothing close to being the light of his life. All his blood, sweat, and tears weren't for himself or me, or even the family unit. They were all completely and totally for his baby. Meanwhile, I was doing the same, though in the opposite way. I did take us being married seriously. I was trying to force us together as a couple so we would be a complete family for our child. I felt like a fly on the wall of a very personal conversation. Cove didn't seem to under notice when you looked over at him. His face, a, co a completed patchwork of emotions. Oh, yes. Eventually, I woke up and saw what I was doing. I realized it wasn't going to work, not like that. When I was ready for it, I talked to Cliff about separating and starting up the divorce process. He was shocked by it, and unfortunately, it wasn't too long after when you had your accident, Cove. Jamie, I don't know how much Cove really told you about it, but when he broke his arm, it terrified all of us. Cove could have died even back then, we knew he'd likely have a permanent scar he'd have to live with forever. Our parenting hurt our child. And he was the one who'd have to carry the repercussions. You were a bit taken aback to be referred to directly. You still felt a little out of place, and she seemed completely focused on her son. Cope grimaced, and the hand holding his phone shook. Mom. Kira continued as if she'd never paused. It was heartbreaking. And then on top of it all, we had to put you through your parents breaking up. Taking that back wasn't an option, despite the timing. It felt like everything we had worked so hard for to make you happy was for nothing. I chose to believe we'd fix our lives from there, but to Cliff, it seemed hopeless. He failed his son. It was easier for me in some ways. I had my family to lean on. That made it feel less daunting, less impossible. Cliff had only ever really known being on his own. By the hap happenstance of his birth and then by choice, when we broke up, he knew he was going to have to put back the pieces of what was left alone. I wanted to be there for him, even after everything, but I was the one divorcing him. It was impossible. I never managed to be someone he truly relied on, and I had to remember that wasn't changing. As bleak as it felt at the time, Cliff still tried not to let any of that show to you, Cove. He did what he could to keep your spirits high about the move, your new house, the scar, everything. So that's why... Hang on. Getting my voices mixed up. So that's why... Cove trailed off. He had misunderstood the impact of his injury had on his parents. You 
you were reminded of something that made more sense now. Mr. Holden had been so helpful with Cobe. Cobe's old Halloween costume because he didn't want Cobe to be saddened by the scar. It was clear Cove was coming to the same realizations. Now, now, with that all said, if Cliff was a completely perfect and wonderful guy, I wouldn't have left him. If it was even pretty good, I would have stayed. It was hard not to have custody. Sometimes I felt like I was a fun aunt rather than the mom I always wanted to be. I might have overcompensated a little at times because of that. She forced a laugh, but it had an uncomfortable edge to it. You could tell she was trying to blow off a very real anxiety of hers. Cove looked ready to say something. But his mom kept talking, kept moving forward. Still, it's not Cliff's fault alone that our relationship didn't work. We were always better as, a co as co parents than spouses. But I knew when separating that it wasn't going to be even. And Cove, the only reason I could stand not being there for you all the time is because I knew that if the situation was reversed and I could have provided a more stable environment, Cliff would have done the same. Your dad would give up his house, his shop, even his right arm if it would guarantee you that you were safe and happy. So as painful as it was, I was sure you'd be okay because you were still with someone who'd love Loved you more than anything else in the world. Cove lowered his head, tears falling to the ground. He tried to speak. It took him a few tries. Thank you for telling me. His voice cracked, and Kira made an alarmed sound on the other end of the line. Sorry, baby. I didn't mean to make you cry. I get it. It's okay. He was still crying. Everyone can tell being physically pre present or not. I love you, Mom. You've always been my mom. Not some aunt. My mom. I love you, too. Her tone was thick with emotion. She was at the edge of a voice break herself. I'm so lucky to be your mom. She started to sniffle openly. Don't feel bad for me with how it worked out. I promise that none of it was your fault. And, it, and it's not as though I'm completely miserable over here. I have an incredible life with a beautiful baby boy of my own who calls whenever he can. At that, Cove's tears only came down heavier. Thank you. Kira sighed affectionately, and you could hear the warmth in her voice. I think that's good for now. Maybe we should end the call, take a moment? Is that really all right? He tightened his grip on his phone. You could see how emotionally exhausted he looked. Of course. of course. We'll be in touch soon. For now, you'll only be able to keep thanking me or apologizing. Hey. hey. Cove cried out defensively over the accusation, making his mom snicker. Bye, and goodbye to you, Jamie. I'm glad you're there for my baby. See you. Bye, Mom. I love you. I love you, too. Cove hung up. He let his hand drop to his side, his phone brushing the fabric of his sweatsuit. His other hand went up to his face. He tried to wipe his tears from his eyes. 
His face was red, and he struggled to put up his phone back in his bag one-handed. You could tell he was getting worked up. He finally just used both his hands and sealed his phone back into his normal place. Cove sniffed and then reached out for you. His hand trembled in your grasp, and you squeezed back. He needed to feel your support. You want to go see your dad again? He didn't have to tell you what was on his mind for this. Cove nodded his head weakly. You rushed back the way you came, feet pounding across the boards of the dog to return to the scuba shop for the third time. It was a little difficult to keep up with him. He, his stride was already longer than yours, but with him almost running, you had to pick up the pace. You reached his dad's store and Cove still wasn't slowing down. He pushed his way through the door at full speed. His hand released yours as he charged in. Major Holden had been walking around in the middle of the store, checking over things. Immediately, he turned to the sound. What's wrong? What? Where's the fire? He froze when he got a look at Ko's face. He worriedly opened his mouth, probably to ask what was wrong, but then Ko lost himself at his father. Ko threw his arms around Mr. Holden's neck. He buried his face in his dad's shoulder and started to sob with deep, kitchen breaths. Cliff clearly had no idea what was going on and his hands hovered awkwardly in the air. He looked at you for a brief second, hoping for understanding, before turning all his attention to on Cove. He wrapped both his arms around Cove's back. Cove looked secure in his father's embrace, protected and safe. It's okay. It'll be okay. Whatever it is, it's going to be okay. Cole kept crying. He inhaled deeply, his voice choking up when he tried to speak. I'm so sorry. You, you always tried to be there for me when I was growing up. When I was mean to you. I'm sorry. Oh God, this is gonna make me cry. Man. Excuse the waterworks. Mr. Holden was completely taken aback. He hadn't expected this to be the issue. Okay. I... You don't have to apologize for that. But... Kids are allowed to be mad at their parents. It's my job to take care of you. I really didn't do anything special. Ko shook his head as empathetically as he could while still tucked in against his dad. You've always supported me no matter what. You've always loved me. I wish I realized how much you did sooner. Ko squeezed him tighter. Thank you. I love you, dad. At his son's heartfelt confession, the father became choked up as well. He compressed Cove into a crushing hug. I do love you. I always will. You can count on that. I want to be there for you too. Oh, don't make me cry again. Don't make me cry again. They clung onto one another, absorbed in the moment. Then, after a little while longer, they slowly began to loosen their hold. <sighs> K 
Coco sniffled and moved to, so he could use his palm to wipe away his tears. His dad's shirt was visibly damp where his face had been. Cliff patted the top of Coe's shoulders. He looked at his son with pride. You've grown up so much. Coe started to laugh through his tears, a wavering smile on his lips. You doubted that Cove would have ever thought that crying on his dad's shoulder was a sign of maturity, but it was true. Cove had changed over the years. You were glad to see Cove grow. Cove used to cry a lot over his parents, and he still did. Despite the similarity, the defining coveness, there was a big difference between the two occasions. You were proud of him. Cove wiped at his eyes again. You're a good dad. You're a good son. Mr. Hogan was plainly touched by the words and beamed his beloved child. Cove looked away and Charlie traced his scar. Cliff chuckled and released Cove to rub the back of his neck. The earlier panic had bled off and left the confusion. Uh, I'm glad we had this talk, but what was it that made you cry in the first place? You weren't too bad off when you left before. Oh. Cove dug his head further down, getting a very good look at the scuff marks on the floor. I called Mom. I wanted to talk to her about all this. He kicked one of his feet shyly, swinging it back and forth against the ground. Things felt really hard when I was younger, but it wasn't just me going through stuff, Dad. You never give yourself credit. Cliff smiled gently and gripped Cope's shoulder with reassurance. Kira is an amazing person to come to my defense. For me, the only hard part was seeing you and her unhappy. Everything else, that was nothing. He wrapped an arm around Cove's neck for another side hug. Cove leaned into the embrace and glanced up at his dad. Your old man is tougher than he looks. Check out how powerful these arms are. And this is ten years on. I was in my prime those days. Cove laughed. It was a light sound, full of tough fondness. Okay, okay. He quieted down a little, finding a quick moment of seriousness. Thanks again, Dad. I know you don't want me to feel bad, and I'm happy because of everything you and Mom did. I have a really nice life. Mr. Holden's contentance became much more serious. He didn't take what was said lightly. Cove, you are very welcome. That's so good to hear. Then he let Cove go again. This time, they both took a step back to their normal proximity. Mr. Holden cleared his throat. He looked at you right in the eyes. Absolutely. I also appreciate that you were here for support, Jamie. What a loyal partner. Cove looked back down, embarrassed. I'm glad I could be here. I want to be there for you too, Mr. Holden. I'm glad I could be here. When Cove stopped staring at the floor, he smiled at him. Cliff smiled warmly. He nudged Cove gently as if to say, look how lucky you are. Hey, maybe I ought to give you another $20 for all this. You've put up with a lot over the years. Cove's cheeks puffed up in a pout. No. Find it. Is there a clip for it? Is there a clip for it? Is there a clip for it?
Not this again. You suddenly remember how weird it was the first time. It really didn't need to be repeated. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. I'll leave making jokes about that to Cove. Cove smiled, satisfied at that. All right. Cove exhales slowly, his posture relaxing. We better get going. You still have work, Dad. I think Jamie has been patient enough. Cliff grinned and waved the two of you all. Sure thing. I'm happy you both stopped in, but you gotta go and have some fun. Be careful out there. Um, I don't need to go jet skiing anymore. Jamie, if you still want to go, I don't mind watching. No way. You are a mature young man, and if you want to jet ski, then you should go out and jet ski. I'll still be, I'll still be here if you need anything, right? Yeah, okay. Cove waved to his dad as he started walking out. You follow when you turned back to Mr. Holden before you went out the door. He was waving. Bye, kids. You'll do great. Once again, as had become today's habit, you and Cove walked down the dock side by side. This time, Cove had a bounce back in his step. His smile was soft but radiant. Thanks for staying, and sorry for how long it took. You'd do the same for me. You had his back and he had yours. It was just how things went between the two of you. Cove grinned at you, all grateful positively. Positivity and sunshine. Blech. The water lapped at the dock beneath your feet. Cove looked down when a particularly strong wave crashed against it. It's weird to think about my parents' relationship. There's all this stuff that I don't know because I wasn't there, or because I was just a kid, or because I didn't even exist yet. It feels really complicated. Really? It seemed fairly straightforward. It wasn't that complicated. You just listened to it explained to us. He looked out into the ocean wistfully for a moment before he shook it off. It's nice. I'm happy they were married, even if they didn't stay together in the end. I'm glad you're feeling better. Try to refocus on what was ahead. You asked about what he thought about marriage for himself now. Speaking of marriage, Cole's eyes widened curiously as he turned to face you. Are you scared of it because of everything that happened with your parents? Cole shook his head shyly. He didn't hesitate for a second. No. Surprisingly, I don't have issues about the idea of getting married someday. You looked at him, not bothering to hide your intrigue. He chuckled self-consciously at the right reaction he got. I mean... I mean, don't get me wrong. Trying to actually propose would be terrifying. I'm sure planning a whole wedding would be so hard, especially for me. But just the thought of having someone I love that I was married to, that I'd spend the rest of my life with, that doesn't scare me. It actually, it makes me happy to think about. Both of you snuck smiles at each other. What about you? 
Would you ever want to be officially married someday? Yes, it's something I really want someday. I don't see myself ever getting married. I'm not sure. I'd only get married if I found someone really special. I haven't thought about it. You didn't want to answer. Yes, some. it's something I really want someday. It was a bit of a dream for you. Oh. He quickly decided to change the subject after that admission. All right, no more distractions. Let's go. It's time to jet ski. Yeah, let's do it. The two of you began to more quickly make your way across the boards. Despite your assignment, you were both careful. Neither of you wanted an accident, especially after what happened with Code's first jet skiing trip. You finally got to the rental place. You were surprised at how easy the process was. It took no time at all for Code to climb on his jet ski with shaky legs. You rented your own jet ski. You spent this entire time wanting to jet ski and you were thrilled to finally climb onto one. It was lime green with blue detailing. The jet ski rocked slightly as you got on, bobbing with the waves. You looked across to Cove. He sat motionless astride his jet ski, preparing himself to start it up. Even from your distance, you could tell his hands were clamped onto the handless handles too tightly. He was stiff and nervous. It'll be alright, Cove. Trust yourself. He took a deep breath. You could see the rise and fall of his chest. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. He inhaled slowly and started up the jet ski. It roared forward and you were surprised you could hear him squeak over the sound of the engine. He stopped after a few seconds and breathed again and after he calmed down, he started up once more. Cove sputtered and stalled with it for a while, going a little farther each time he grew more comfortable with the feel. Cove eventually reached the point where he only stopped the jet ski when he had something to say. He kept shouting things at you. This is amazing! Did you see that, Jamie? This is so great! You got your own jet ski going as well. You made sure to keep a safe distance. Go watch what you did with enthusiasm. Nice turn! <laughs> he zoomed forward and you could hear his bright laugh ring across the waves. You were relieved he'd taken it so well. You had no trouble controlling the machine yourself and enjoyed the freedom it offered. You sped around the ocean with a wide smile on your face. Eventually, the sun set and you had to pack up. Ko was thankfully still in one piece. No cast necessary. After everything was returned, Cove dug his phone out of his bag and texted his parents to let them know all about his triumph. An idea to take a photo to mark the occasion struck Cove and he wanted you to join him in the selfie. You got into a silly pose. You showed off your best angles. You posed and Cove tried to follow your lead. He took a few pictures and you pointed out the best one. You liked how it turned out and he sent it to you. It'd be a nice memory. His phone vibrated after only a moment after texting it out. Mr. Holden and Kira had likely been waiting the entire day to find out how this outing would go. And with the news of his success, both of Cove's parents sent back how proud they were of Cove for how far he'd come. Watching him grinning in the setting sun after facing so many fears that day, you felt the same. I'm going to save there. Thank you all for joining me on those two episodes. Well, the end of last... The ending of the charity and um, this full episode. 
Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Bye-bye.